introduce yourself. Um, I always love to obviously know your name, but where you're tuning in from as well, um, where you're watching from, so your location. And then if it's social media handles and LinkedIn, it's always is really great to kind of connect on this event and then off as well. So do jump in that chat with your name, location, and then social media handles and LinkedIn. I see Ben already jumping in. Thank you so much, Ben. Let's get it started. Um, and just to note as well, in the chat, it'll say two panelists, and just kind of drop that down to say panelists and attendees. So everyone then in the chat will be able to kind of connect and see where you're from. Um, so I see a whole bunch of humans from Earth. Amazing. Yes. Melbourne, yeah. <laughs> Sydney, incredible. Um, I don't want to waste too much time. Do keep that going. That's awesome. Um, and let me introduce myself. So I'm John, and I'm the partnership lead at General Assembly, which means I reach out to incredible brands and speakers, such as Ben from Pivot, um, to help me deliver these community events. Um, so if you're joining us for the first time and don't know much about General Assembly and who we are and what we do, uh, we're a tech education company offering high demand skills in tech, and this is through our full-time and part-time courses, plus the workshops, and then these three events as well, where our mission is to empower those to pursue who they love, and help them with their career transitions into skills such as UX design, data science, and software engineering. Uh, that's it. If you do have any questions regarding General, General Assembly, do feel free to reach out to our incredible frontline team at oznz at geo.co. I've just popped their email in the chat there. They'll be happy to answer any questions that you've got. If you do have any questions during the session, please do pop them in that Q&A box. And then we'll hopefully get towards them like 10 to 15 minutes. Um, then we're going to go through them and answer those questions there. So do direct them to that Q&A box as well. We're recording the session. We'll be sure to send that out hopefully by end of week. So tomorrow before everyone breaks for their Easter. Um, and then lastly, before we get started, General Assembly Australia would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first Australians and traditional custodians of the land where we live, learn and work. Paying our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Thank you so much, everyone. Keep that engagement going in the chat. I'm going to pass it straight over to Ben to kick things off. Um, so take it away. Great. Thanks for that, John. Um, and yes, guys, before you ask, yes, we did uh, uh, coordinate on our wardrobes today. Um, so um, uh, my name is Ben Nash. I'm a financial advisor, and uh, I help people with with things like uh, like buying property in a smart way. Today, we'll be talking about um, all about buying property in the post-COVID uh, environment. Property market is uh, is crazy hot at the moment in different pockets around the country. Uh, our capital cities, we're seeing in Sydney, I know that we're seeing some staggering uh, property growth. So uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about the property market generally, but also about um, what we what we should be thinking about if you're looking at buying property today. Um, firstly, yeah, uh, shout out to General Assembly for for hosting the events. If you're not around, what, what they do already, uh, they do some great uh, stuff. So check out their their courses um, and raise home ownership. Who uh, who have kindly partnered for this event. Um, also, they're sort of shaking up the mortgage market. So, for people in that uh, that are looking for that sort of support, uh, do check them out, guys. Before I get into the content, for any lawyers there, please uh, please don't uh, rush out and make any life changing decisions off the back of what we cover today. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to seek out advice before uh, before jumping in with property. It's such a big decision that you really should be doing that anyway. So. Uh, yeah, make sure you, you get your strategy right. It's going to pay massive dividends over time. So um, I'm actually just, I, I was just doing a bit of research when putting together the the, uh, the, the presentation for today. And I, I thought a good place to start, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a good place to start was around the, the, the past, the historical property growth that we've seen. And I saw, um, I found some core logic data that showed basically the um, median house price in Sydney uh, from 1993, which they, they actually put this report out at 2018, which is 25 years between those two. Um, so 94,000 back in 93. 2018, we saw 445,000. Uh, and we've seen some pretty staggering growth since then. In the, in the last three years since 2018, we've seen um, the median property price today in Sydney is, is $1,023,000. And then you'll see that I've got 2031 and 2041 there, which is all I've done is extrapolated out the growth rate of 6.8%, which you can see here, which is basically like the, 
the hundred year return on on Australian property to say what will what will the average uh, median house price be um, ten years from now and twenty years from now? So you can see that it's expected to pretty much double in the next ten years and then almost to double again. And I did. Um, I didn't have the stats right in front of me, but I've gone back six decades and um, the the numbers actually are exactly the same. So there's nothing for me. And while I, I don't think the, the growth that we've seen between you know 2018 and 2021 um, can continue indefinitely, but there's nothing to suggest that the long, long-term um, uh, trend, uh, growth rates on property will change over time. And that's why, you know, if you're buying property or if you're, uh, you know, if you if you're looking at buying property either to live in or as an investment, the sooner you get in, the sooner you can start getting those results. And on the flip side, the longer you wait, the more difficult it is going to be to actually get into the market. So today, I'm going to help you understand some of the strategies and tactics you can use to make your next step on the property ladder an easier one. Now, uh, look, there's, you know, the world has obviously changed with, with COVID. We've, we've seen a uh, record low interest rates, I think like 1.8% or something at the moment, which is, which is pretty staggering and certainly never seen before um, levels. You know, we, we, we don't know exactly what the, the world's going to look like in the, in the next little bit with, uh, with all the COVID pandemic and, and what, that, what that actually means. Um, the property market has definitely been disrupted and we're seeing, you know, people moving out of the regions, a lot of companies having work from home first policies and um, they they are, it, it's, it's caused some structural change to, you know, how people buy property, where people buy property and how much people pay for property as well. Um, the government is splashing a lot of cash around, although that's uh, that's thankfully winding back. Although um, you know, likely to continue for some time into the future uh, as well. But look, you know, while some things have changed, there there are a lot of things that um, still the same. You know, you, it, people still want and need money to be able to live the lifestyle that they want. Um, smart companies are still making good money. We're seeing the economy is actually surprisingly doing pretty well, definitely in Australia, you know, unemployment rates are low, tech companies are going ballistic because of everyone's reliance on technology now, which is driving a lot of, um, you know, for a lot of people, anyone that works for a tech company, you, your stock options and share plans are getting more and more lucrative. And that creates that creates opportunity and it creates um, a disruption. And, and the last one here is that people still want to live at at Bondi, and I, I use the word Bondi because it's iconic, but um, you know, people still want to live in desirable suburbs. The, the inner ring of, of properties um, around Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, uh, as well as some of the more you know regional places, like I think half of Sydney wants to buy a place in Byron Bay at the moment because everyone's been there on holidays while we've been on state-based lockdowns. So. I, you know, while uh, while there there is going to be this new normal, I think it's going to be pretty normal. And when as I think when we think long term about this as well, that there's you know there's not going to be a lot of um, long term change to the property market or or our desire to live in um, good areas or, or and own property ultimately. So. Uh, we'll talk. We'll talk a bit more about how you can take advantage there. But before I crack into the straight property, uh, the property tactics, I um, just want to flag that you know while everyone's situation is unique, that there are some really common challenges that people face when it comes to money. This applies to property specifically, but also to your money more broadly. Now, what we're seeing, you know, because we're in this information age, that. Um, you know, people are, we've got this information overload that there's just so much noise out there when it comes to your money, property strategies as well, that it's almost like we're drinking from the fire hose and it's sort of like, it's hard to know who to listen to, who to trust. Specifically in, um, when it comes to property, that there are a lot, lot, lot of, uh, of hidden agendas, conflicts of interest, and it, 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 it can be a bit of a minefield. The second one is finding balance. And so I was just talking to one of the guys in our team um, just before about, you know, people, we see people that, that are making really good incomes and you want to have a good lifestyle, but you need to find about the right balance for, 
um, getting ahead with money at the rate that you want while you're able to actually live the lifestyle that you want. And, and finding that, that balance is different for everybody, but it is really the key to financial success. So, uh, but people struggle to find that balance because it's not easy. The third one that I've got here is the FOMO, um, which everybody knows, the fear of missing out. I think that's driving a bit of property decisions at the moment. And then FOFU, which is the fear of fucking it up, basically. So you don't want to do the wrong thing. And especially with property, it causes a lot of paralysis that you don't want to do something dumb that's going to end up costing you a whole bunch of money over time and, um, and mean that you don't get the results that you want. So that what that leads us to is, is to get stuck. And it's stuck, not always stuck doing nothing. Sometimes it's just stuck doing the same thing that you've been doing in the past and therefore missing the opportunity to be getting results, to be building your momentum. So there are three elements that you need to get right when it comes to buying property and to your money more broadly. The first one here is structure, which is all about making it easy to save and manage your money and making it really clear what money you have to work with when it comes to strategies like buying property or investing, paying down debt, <clears throat> whatever the case may be. The next one that we've got there is strategy, which is about, you know, having being clear on what's important to you, really understanding the different like pathways that you can take to get you from where you are right now today to exactly where you want to be with your money. And then the third one here is uh, is solutions and making sure that you've got the right investments and and product solutions to back up your strategy and give you that reliable, consistent progress over time, and importantly, avoiding the chances of downsides and setbacks and those momentum killing mistakes. So, um, we, you know, we're, today we're talking specifically about property and property strategy and tactics, but be aware that if any one of those areas is missing from what you do, you're going to end up, it's going to end up dragging the others down. You know, if you've got, you might have a great property strategy and a great property investment, but if you don't have a good structure, you don't know how much you've got to work with when it comes to buying property or um, how much you should be allocating, how much you should borrow, etc. If you're good at saving and a good strategy, but you choose a bum property like bad solutions, then that's going to be a major problem as well. And a good, um, good structure and, and, and a, so a, a good at saving great property, but with the poor strategy means that you can, you know, pay more tax than you need, you sort of end up costing yourself money over time. So you, the power of those three elements together is much more than any one of them alone. And as I say, you really do need to get all three of them right to get to uh, real financial success. So um, look, what we've found is, is that there are different stages that people go through with their money, essentially ranging from really bad to really good. Um, and the things that, that actually um, typify, I suppose, which of the stages people are in is how quickly you're getting ahead with your money, what's your ability to live the lifestyle that you want, and how you're feeling about your money, your peace of mind, confidence level, stress level. So starting at the distress stage, and, and it is a progression that you can move through the stages. I'll give you some tips on how you can do that uh, based on where you're at in a sec. But um, for people in this distress state, that's when they're making no um, <clears throat> no financial progress at all, or sometimes even going a bit backwards. From a lifestyle point of view, they're essentially trapped because they've got no money to do the lifestyle or personal choices that they want. And then from a peace of mind point of view, obviously they're stressed out. I found that you can't actually get out of this distress state without making a commitment to your money. Money is one of these things that it is really important, but it's, it's also not really urgent. So it's easy to let your money put it on the back burner for the tomorrow that never comes. Um, so if you if you end up in the distress stage though, you need to make a commitment to, to being financially successful. And without that commitment, it's definitely not gonna happen on its own. The next stage up is the stalled stage. And this is a pretty common one. Um, it's where people are, are making some financial progress, but it's slow and slower than they would ideally like it to be that you're able to do some of the personal lifestyle things that you want, but it, it typically comes at the sacrifice of getting ahead at the rate that you want. And then from a peace of mind point of view, you're not fully stressed out like the people in the distress stage, but you've got that sort of niggling thought in the back of your mind that there's something that you're missing out on that could be um, you know, getting better results. The next stage is we see people in the comfortable stage, and that's where now from a financial perspective, you're starting to build some real momentum um, if you're finding a good balance between getting ahead with your money and living the lifestyle that you want. And from peace of mind point of view, you're building a real confidence. 
The, the fourth stage is what I've very technically called the killing it stage. And for people in the killing it stage, that's when you're making really rapid acceleration now, basically no limits on the personal or lifestyle choices that you can make. And from a peace of mind point of view, you're, um, you're feeling completely carefree. So guys, it is a progression and there are some key things to do to, to progress through those stages. The first one I've got there is making that commitment. To get from the stall to the comfortable stage, you need to take action, but take action on an ongoing basis. Um, and because it's no, there's no such thing as a set and forget money strategy these days. It's it's um, you need that you know because the world's changing so quickly. COVID is a perfect example that you need to do stuff now, but also to do it, uh, you know, to keep doing things in the future so that you continue to take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of you and course correct where needed so that you can get the best results. Then um, to get into the killing it stage, that's where you need to maximize every opportunity that's available to you to um, squeeze every bit of juice out of your situation so you build your money momentum in the fastest way possible. For you guys uh, watching along, I would love it um, if anyone can identify with any of the stages. You don't have to say which one, but uh, if that sort of resonates with you, I uh, would love for you to just pop it in the, in the chat box um, and let us know. As I say, it is a, a progression to, to, to get through and it's, it's not always clear, but today I'm gonna give you some of the hacks and tactics that you can do to get through that, um, those stages faster. Uh, Haminda says stalled. Um, yes, and Damien says he's between stalled and comfortable. I find that sometimes we can be in, in some parts of our money you know, feeling like we're stalled and then in, in, in other parts feeling like we're more comfortable. So um, Dee says finally uncomfortable, well done. That's a, it's a good feeling. I think going through each of the stages is a, is a big, um, yeah, like a, a, a relief or a, a, an achievement as well. So um, there are some, some things that you can do to make your life faster and, and that's what we're, uh, we're going to cover today. So uh, property basics and the things that you need to know. Look, the first thing that I've got here is I just want to um, talk about the difference in shares versus property and you know the advantages and disadvantages of each. Now, what I've done just to make the maths really easy and 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 simple to follow along with, I've <clears throat> I've looked at return a return on property of five percent and a return on shares of five percent. So basically the same. Now, you saw from that previous example that I gave you that, that really the long-term return on property is uh, is closer to that, well, it is 6.8%. The long-term return on shares is, is around 8.7% or 8.8%, um, depending on whether it's an Australian or international. Now, but what I've done here is I've been really conservative with each of those, and I have, um, I've extrapolated out what the, what the um, property market, what, what the return on those investments would be. So basically you buy a $500,000 property and um, if it grows at 5%, after the first year, your property is gonna be worth about $525,000. If you had $100,000 and invested in, into shares, that your, your money would be worth about $105,000 at the end of that one year period. Then I've extrapolated out for the rest of the 10 year period. You can see that after 10 years, the property's worth 814,000, shares is worth 1. Uh, 110,000. And then if we keep going, you know, after 20 years, you see property's now 1.3 mil. These are getting closer to the numbers that I was looking at before. Um, and shares, shares are, the, the gap between shares and property is, is widening. And the, the reason that I show this is because when, you, when you're buying property, most people are borrowing. They're, they're very rarely getting you know, $500,000 and buying a $100,000 property. They're getting up like $100,000 and then borrowing some money from the bank and then they've got this bigger asset that's working. You've got this bigger asset working for you. So you could see in this example that if you were to use that $100,000 to get into a $500,000 property, it's very difficult for even a really good share portfolio to compete because it's starting from a much lower lower base. So the um, the le leverage is the key driver of property returns. If you look at like property versus shares, the, the returns are pretty much the same, but when you introduce the borrowing element, it means that um, 
it means that, that yeah, you basically leverage and amplify the returns that you get. So look, it, it's not a, there are things like interest costs to consider and growth rates and all of these things, but you can see from these numbers that there is so much room between um, the two of them that, uh, that, you, that there's plenty of room to cover those sorts of incidental costs uh, and still be much, much better off over time. So leverage is the, the key driver of what makes property a really great investment. Both have their place. I should just say that we don't, we have most of our clients will invest in both shares and property, you know, at different points. And it all sort of comes down to the strategy. I'm going to elaborate on that um, a little bit more as we go through as well. So leverage is the, the driver here. You've got to be aware with property, the entry and exit costs are high. You know, you've got the stamp duty in different in different places around Australia, legal fees, title searches, uh, mortgage fees, mortgage application fees. Um, and then when you sell, you know, real estate agent costs, legal fees again, um, tax that you need to pay on property as well, depending on how you're buying it. So buying and selling, and it used to be more common in the past, but people were, uh, you know, following these buy flip property strategies, that all of those costs eat, eat into your return. And and when you look at it like tra in a transparent way, it's very, you, you're taking away from your return. So I suppose what I'm getting at is that when when we uh, help people buy property, and I suppose when we what our philosophies are around property is that uh, you want to buy good properties and hold them for the long term because then you can get the return on a good investment over time with, and make a whole bunch of money. And you can see from some of those previous examples that the numbers are so big that it's like, why try to push for more? Um, Another thing to be aware of when it comes to buying property is, is a family guarantee. And for anyone that's not familiar with the family guarantee, it's uh, so it's got a few different names that they sometimes call it guarantor, sometimes they call it um, family pledge. Uh, there are a few different labels which can be a little bit confusing, but ultimately what the family guarantee is, is, is that in, when you buy a property, instead of, instead of um, using a deposit or paying your deposit in cash, what the deposit is essentially secured against um, against another property, and where this works is when um, you know typically where where it works is if mum and dad um, have a property that it has a low or no mortgage on it, or there's a lot of like what they call equity in the property. Um, they can secure your deposit. So if you need a you know hundred thousand dollar deposit, that loan gets secured against the value of their property. Then you get the hundred thousand dollars. You can use it for the deposit, and then you can borrow, then the banks will lend you enough money to go and um, buy the the property outright. So family guarantee. It's a strategy that's not for everybody. It doesn't have to be family. It can be friends, although um, you know it's it's that that can be fraught with a bit of danger as well. And I don't know too many people that are wanting to, to uh, secure their mates borrowings, but um, yeah, there's no rule around that. It's really just dependent on, um, yeah, what you, I suppose, what, what, uh, who you can convince maybe. Um, but it is a great strategy in that it, it allows you to purchase a property without using any cash at all. And obviously you need to get your numbers right, get your strategy right, make sure you can afford it and be smart when you buy. But if, you know, it takes a long time to save a property deposit and we're seeing the market moving at the same time that you're sort of like chasing, chasing your tail, which is, you know, can be difficult, can be frustrating. So, um, yeah, using this can 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 help you to get in sooner. The other thing that it does is that it allows you to keep your cash for uh, your emergency fund. And, you know, you want to have an emergency fund even more so when you own property. So even if you've got 50 grand or 100 grand ready to buy a property, if you can hold on to that money, park it in your offset account um, and have it available, not to spend, but if you have an actual, actual emergency, then that's something that um, I think is is can be quite good. Again, be smart, but um, be aware of the family guarantee. Ask some questions. There's a bunch of stuff online uh, around that as well. Pays uh, Mother's Day is coming up, guys. Second Sunday in May. Pays to get uh, get Mum a nice Mother's Day card and a and a uh, bunch of flowers to uh, you know give yourself a better chance of having that conversation if you're thinking about it as well. 
The other thing to be aware of is the difference in buying a property as an investment versus buying as your own home. Now, it's one of the things that I've seen from talking to a lot of people about their money is that they're, um, the, they, they generally people want to buy property as their own home. People like the idea of buying as their own home. They um, they want to you know be able to do the property the way that they want. They don't want to deal with the annoying property manager. And um, but be aware that there is a significant difference. Often, it, and it depends. There's no one uh, better or worse one. It really depends on your situation, tax rates, income, whatever. But there's a significant difference between the financial outcomes of buying a property versus as an investment versus buying a property as your own home. So. Like I say, no one right approach, but you should understand the difference and you look at the difference in the numbers um, so that you're you're aware of which one is better for you. And then you can think about, because it's not just whichever one's most financially uh, beneficial that's necessarily going to be the right strategy for you, but knowing the numbers means that you can balance the um, financial side of the equation with the emotional side and your what you want and your... Um, yeah, how you feel about living in your own home versus living versus managing an investment property. Also, understanding where to buy. Look, I, I talk to a lot of people and I think that because there's so much noise in the property market, um, basically all of the time that um, people are trying to be really tricky with their property buying. There's always some person that talks about how they made uh, you know, a whole bunch of money over time with their with their U butte sort of property strategy. But um, the the numbers that I showed you before were just on median house price in um, in Sydney. It's broadly applicable to this to all metro areas in across Australia. That you don't need to find the next property hotspot uh, to to make a bunch of money. What I tend to find. Um, well, I, I think that buying, you know, sticking to the fundamentals and buying a property where there's strong demand as and where there's strong demand is desirable locations, um, but strong population growth as well and limited supply. So a lot of the, the fringe suburbs will have um, mandates from their councils on how densely populated they can be. Um, some are more than others. So we see like I know that there are pockets in Sydney where the, de the, the property dense, the density is really high and it's just all apartments everywhere, um, that just means that there's going to be more supply. And it's not to say that it's not a, a it's not a, a, that it's a bad place to buy, but it's just because you've got one side of the equation that there's excessive supply, then it just means that the growth is likely to be slowed with the same amount of demand. Um, so understanding where you should buy and, and my personal philosophy is sticking to those you know, stay away from the actual CBD areas because there's high supply there as well and a lot of apartments and stuff. But, um, and then just look and try and get uh, as close to the city as possible, get as much land as possible. Um, and you, we've seen all of the properties in those areas grow really well for the last sort of forever. So if you if you start get trying to get too tricky, that's where you can actually shoot yourself in the foot and end up, um, you know, with a, with a, poorly performing or even an average property, which is a real drag on, on your ability to get ahead financially. I know I've been there myself. I, I bought this property when I was in uni and never really lost money, but it never made me money and uh, well, it never made me, made me much money. But for like five years, I had this property and I didn't want to sell it and it was a pain to deal with. And uh, I, I think that, you know, it, it holds you back and stops you from buying other properties, which uh, will actually grow. The other thing uh, here is really just balancing your home in the the amount of assets that you've got in your home versus the amount of assets that you've got outside of your home. And what I mean by that is that if you you know you've got your if you think about your wealth, you've got a whole pool of wealth. You've got you know superannuation, you've got cash, any cash savings in your personal name, you've got shares, managed funds, ETFs in your personal name. Then you've got property, then you've got debt. That's all in together, but your home, while it's nice to have a nice home in it and your home is technically an asset, because you always need a roof over your head, your home is not really an asset that's going to give you much financial benefit until you sell it. And then you're just going to have to buy another home anyway. So 
if you all want to, if you want, say you want um, a an income each year of say one hundred and fifty thousand dollars when you're in the future, when you're not relying on your work. I'm not going to say retirement, but not you want to be financially independent, essentially. That the rough rule of thumb is, you need about five percent from a portfolio of assets. Uh, you need you can get about five percent from a portfolio of assets in an income um, without eating into capital. So uh, that may, in human words, what that means is that if you've got a million dollars invested in a in a diversified share portfolio, that you should be able to get an income of about fifty thousand dollars each year. And then the implication is, if you want one fifty, then you need about three million dollars in assets. Now, if you go out and buy a $2 million home, then um, if you buy a $2 million home, then you're, you've got a lot of money tied up in this property. You're going to have to pay down $2 million worth of debt or, or however much the debt actually is. But then you're going to need to have, you know, five, essentially like $5 million of assets. So again, there's no one right way, but it, it's easy to, to think about the home independent to your other assets. So that, and but you need to, to get the right balance for you and make sure that you're going to have enough other assets to actually give you the financial outcomes that you want, not just a nice roof over your head. What you should be thinking about is looking at the pathway forward, making sure that you, you can afford the property at the level that you want, pay down the debt and build enough assets outside of that property, investments, shares, other investment properties, whatever, to allow you to, to give the life, uh, to have the amount of money that you want to have the lifestyle that you want in the future. Um, and yeah, be aware that there can be stepping stones to your dream home as well. Like it's, it's property is expensive in Australia. So, uh, you know, if you need to do some things to get to where you ultimately want to be buying smaller properties, um, buying properties, maybe in a different state sometimes, um, making sure you're getting good properties, but having those building blocks to get there can make it easier. If you keep trying to gun to your dream home from the start, like I say, if the property market's running away from you, then um, then you're you're sort of chasing your tail. And one way for you to th to think about it that not a lot of people do is that if you want to own a two million dollar home in the future, if you were to say buy a one million dollar investment property today. It's almost like you're halfway there because it's likely that the $1 million property is going to go up at the same rate, probably, as or, or ish maybe, but at the same rate as the $2 million property, it's just going to be half of the value. So if you could buy you know, the million dollar property halfway there, then you might bolt on another property in the future. Um, and then in the, when you get to the point where you've got enough property, you, you may choose to sell the properties that you have, or there may be way, other ways that you can leverage to get into the property at that time. But ultimately, you're sort of hedging your exposure into the property market along the way. So some strategies to be aware of when it comes to property investing. First one is negative gearing and negative gearing is, well, gearing is just borrowing to invest. So um, borrowing to invest for any guys watching on as well. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to just pop them into the Q and A uh, as I'm going through and I'm going to, I'm going to circle back um, at the end and, and, and sort of answer all the questions together. Um, so yeah, negative gearing is just a uh, gearing is borrowing to invest and then negative the negative or positive, and you probably heard both of those terms, refers to the cash flow of the property. So if the rent is more than all of the expenses, mortgage costs, ongoing costs, strata, all of that sort of stuff, then the the end result of your property investment is positive, is the, is the cash flow positive. There's going to be more money coming in than going out. That's positively geared because you're geared to get the property and the cash flow is positive, therefore positively geared. Negative geared is just that there's a negative cash flow of the property. Now, when you have a negatively geared property, you uh, you get to claim a deduction for what it costs you. So, you know, if you were to say buy a million dollar property and say you're out of pocket by 10, uh, 15 grand a year is about on, on average what it should be costing you um, out of pocket, then you're able to claim a tax deduction. And depending on what your tax rate is, if you're you know, in the top marginal tax bracket, 47.5%, you're getting pretty much half of that money back. Even if you only earn um, 
you know, if you're earning like 40 grand, you are still into the tax bracket where you're getting a third essentially of your whatever cost you pay back, which means that you're, you know, in that in that example, if you're paying 15 and you get a third back or 5,000, the end cost to you is only $10,000 a year. And it does, that means your property only needs to grow at more than $10,000 a year for you to be better off in doing that. So I know that I'm sort of banding a lot of numbers around there, but this negative gearing is a, is a real um, kicker when it comes to buying property and, and it can help massively reduce the, the ongoing cost to you after you do your tax return. Uh, deductions and making sure you, you get some good deductions from property is one thing as well. There are some strategies where if you buy a new property, you can claim things like depreciation, which is actually the, the reduction in the value of the fittings of your property. You know, you buy an oven day one, it's worth a couple of grand. As soon as you cook a roast chicken in there, um, it's worth a bit less than that. That difference doesn't actually cost you money, but it is something that you can claim as a tax deduction when it comes to um, depreciation. So that can be, that can even tip the scales to make new properties positive. Be aware when you buy new properties though, um, not a, not a real big advocate of buying off the plan because it comes with a lot of risk, but I'm going to talk to that when I get into the mistakes and risk section in a minute. Uh, understanding the difference in offset versus redraw is something that you should, you should really be across as well. The people do the, you know, you buy a property, think you're doing the right thing, trying to pay down your debt. Um, and working towards, you know, we think it's, we should be getting debt free and being debt free is good. But how an offset account works is it's a, a bank account that's just sits next to your mortgage where every dollar that you put in, it offsets the, you only pay interest on the net amount between the mortgage account and the um, mortgage account and the, uh, and the offset account. When you, if you build up, say you buy a property and a common strategy is you buy a property, you're saving up for your next property or for your dream home and you might save like a hundred grand or something like that in your offset. If you take it out and use it to buy a property, no, no problem there. Your debt always remained at the, at the level that it initially was. So you're able to claim the tax deductions relating to that debt because this property is now an investment property. With a redraw though, on the other hand, you're actually paying down the debt directly. And if you pay $100,000 of your mortgage down and then redraw it to buy your own home or your dream home, and then you wanna keep that property and use it as an investment property, you're no longer allowed to um, claim a tax deduction for the interest on that portion of the loan because the purpose of you doing the redraw was not to buy an investment property, but to buy your own home. So I've seen a lot of people that have run into a heap of trouble, with, well, not a heap of trouble with this, but just end up in a situation where they're out of pocket by tens of thousands of dollars a year, all from trying to do the right thing, but to not understanding the rules well enough to make it the optimum strategy for them. So this stuff is pretty complex. It's worth chatting through with your mortgage broker or, or financial planner if you're gonna go down this path. But ultimately, um, there is a big difference and you should be aware of that difference and its impact. Debt recycling is another strategy that I'm seeing a bit more of these days. Um, it's where if you, it works for people that own their own home that have a mortgage at, on that home and that want to invest. And essentially what it means is that, say if you've got 10, in the simple terms, you've got $10,000 in cash, you pay that onto your mortgage, you pay the mortgage down, so your mortgage reduces by 10 grand. And at the same time, you draw from another debt that you need to get the right um, mortgage structures with this, but essentially like a line of credit at the same mortgage rate as your property purchase, and then you invest that $10,000. When you do that, you end up getting a tax deduction for, because you're borrowing to invest, then um, essentially you're taking that $10,000 out to invest into your share portfolio, that the interest on that debt is is de now deductible and because the interest on your own home is not deductible how debt recycling works is that over time you reduce down your non-deductible debt and then you're drawing up your tax deductible debt and it can save you in the tens of thousands of dollars a year it also works if you get a big chunk of money you can you can do it all at once which i've seen some people do before um as well so Huge, huge tax dollars to be saved there. Again, it is complex, so make sure you're getting the right advice. The right advice will more than pay for itself, though, uh, if that's an avenue that's available to you. 
mistakes, some of the mistakes that I see people make. Look, the first thing, that, and this is a really big one, is that you don't um, you don't always understand. You know, one of the things that stops people from from investing and buying property in particular is that you don't always understand where the risk is coming from. And if you don't understand where your risk is coming from, then it's almost impossible to manage your risk. Um, and and then or, or and then it's really scary to invest and it's paralyzing. So the key to um, understanding then managing the risk at a level that you need to take confident action is you've got to identify where the risks are coming from, you know, see how you can manage them. There's always some risk left over because risk is what makes you money. You know, buying shares is risky, buying property is risky, doing nothing has risk attached to it as well. So understand, identify those risks, understand the trade-offs, figure out what the right risks are for you, and then you'll be set to get the, you know, the right level of results and have your peace of mind along the way. Lifestyle risk is a big one with property, and I've seen some people that have um, that have really sort of come into some trouble here uh, by not thinking ahead beyond that. They think they wonder, they think about whether they can afford the property today, but they don't think about how that property fits in with the lifestyle that they want to have over time. That doesn't fit in with the. Um, yeah, so I suppose that the other things that they want to do, a common one is like taking time out of the workforce for having children or schooling costs, you know, daycare is really expensive, schooling, you know, if you want to use private schools and stuff, um, you need to, if you want to have the ability to do all of those things, you need to make sure that if you're buying this big property um, at the start, that that's going to be consistent with your with the other things that you want to do. So take the time to map that one out and you can avoid the lifestyle risk, but because if you don't, then you can end up in a position where you're having to either sacrifice some of the stuff that you want to do or sell your property and go backwards, which is not an ideal scenario either. Making your choices in isolation is another big mistake that I see people make as well, which is, you know, people look at a property just as an investment. It happens with all areas of money, not just property. But if you look at a property, is this property a good property? it's really, it might be a great property, but it might not be a great property for you for any number of reasons, not least of which the stuff that I just talked about with the lifestyle risk. So if you, when you're buying property, you want to look at property as part of your overall um, strategy and make sure that it's not only good in absolute terms, but it's gonna be at the right level to deliver you the results that you want. Seeking the best option is another thing that sort of paralyzes people where, you know, I see this typically from your engineers and more analytical people where you're crunching your numbers in spreadsheets, looking at which yield is better versus growth rates versus population growth, like all of these things and trying to find the very best thing, but no one knows what the best thing is until after the fact. So settling for something that's good and taking action now will mean that you can start getting results rather than trying to find this mythic, mythical best option that we won't know until what it is for uh, 10 years anyway, and by then you would have missed the boat. Unconscious prioritization is something as well that um, people, and it's sort of, I, I suppose it's more with your strategy side than with the property uh, selection side, but um, you know we're always prioritizing with our money. We uh, prioritize with how we spend on a day-to-day -day basis and how we invest longer term. Now, what we've found is that when, um, because we're we're all pleasure seeking human beings and beings and spending money like going on a bit of a spending spree now or buying that um, new toy or holiday or um, you know spending more than you know that you should is something that makes us feel good in the moment but something that's bad for us long term. So found that when you make decisions at the fifty thousand foot level, you set certain priorities, but in the day to day we sometimes act in a way that's inconsistent with those priorities. So. You just need to be aware of what your priorities are, start up the top and then make sure that all of your decisions and strategy and actions are consistent with the priorities that you've set for yourself. And getting the wrong advice, this is something it's really, um, it really sort of grinds my gears in the property space. Thankfully, thankfully, the, the, the legislators are, are looking at this more closely now, although it's still nowhere near, near where it needs to be. But, you know, property spruikers, selling off the plan properties, borrowing too much money, you know, um, doing the wrong things. Or, um, you know, you see a financial planner that isn't um, across property and they're convincing you that you don't need that and that you should be just focusing on shares because that's all that they know. 
when you're getting any professional to help you and when you buy property, you do need a team of professionals. You know, your financial planner, I think, is good in my totally biased opinion as a financial planner, but making sure you got the strategy right, your mortgage broker to do all the grunt work and execute on your mortgages, your property conveyancer to help you with um, contracts, searches, all of that sort of stuff. Um, the, and sometimes property buyer's agent as well to help you find and secure properties more quickly, that um, all of these, you need all of these people around you. So make sure you've got the right ones. Make sure you ask them lots of questions and, um, you know, find someone. We, when it comes to, you know, buyer's agents and financial advice, I tend to advocate a fee for service model, which is what we follow, where you pay a fee, you get support. Not like a commission where it's all based on only how much you invest or the property fee. Not to say there's no one, right or wrong approach, um, but the, either of those can be okay. But I think that having a fee for service model just means more transparent. And then the motivation is only making sure that you're super happy as opposed to selling you the, the highest value property possible so that the commission ends up being as big as possible. So guys, uh, look, in terms of next steps, oh, how to plan and, and planning is, is really crucial when it comes to property that th this is the planning process that we use, but it's essentially the same planning process that anybody should use if they're looking at buying property. The first thing you need to do here is focus in on what's important to you. What are the key things on your hit list? You know, um, what should you be thinking about? Um, what, what's, 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 what are the problems that you want to overcome? Then we need to clarify all the bits of your financial situation that are going to impact your decisions, as well as the strategies that you that you want to explore. You know, buying property as your own home versus buying as an investment, for example. Then we map those things out. We use financial modeling tools. This is something that can be can be difficult to do. Well, that is difficult to do without the right tools, and that's where a financial planner um, can help. But if you've got a super simple situation, you're really good with spreadsheets then that can, uh, you can map it out that way as well. Um, but essentially mapping out the different scenarios and then just, you know understanding what they are, I find that it's necessary to understand the numbers and then understand the elements and risks at that point so that you can make a decision that gives you the right balance between the numbers and the risk. Once you've chosen that strategy, you wanna put it all together into an action plan, then automate as much as possible so that you don't have to, the, the, so that you have to do less to get the, um, the results that you want, and then just make sure it happens and keep following the bouncing ball, refine your strategy over time. If you do that, you make sure you've covered all the bases, you've explored the options, you've got a clear action plan, and uh, it'll actually happen for you. The impact though with the, with the from COVID is that, you know, we're, everything's moving so quickly now, you wanna be planning fast, even if you choose not to act. It's better to have a plan and know that you've chosen to wait than just waiting because you think that you should wait without a plan. Um, don't not act out of fear and education is the key to getting over that fear and, you know, understanding risks, where they're coming from, how you can manage them, what's gonna be right for you um, is really crucial there. Um, Playing a solid defensive strategy is is very important in the COVID environment because of the fact that every you know there is a bit more risk out there today. And if if your situation's complicated, the more stuff you've got going on, then um, then get help. You know, especially when it comes to property, good good advice will be a profit center for your investment, not not something that ends up costing you money. So. Um, get help, reach out, ask some questions, learn if, it, if that's right for you. But uh, as I say, it'll pay for itself. So guys, um, for futures, look, this model, the last model I just want to share with you, talks about your progression from where you are today to some point in the future. And what it basically says is that in this future state, you're going to be in one of those four position, one of those four stages that I went through in the, um, in the, uh, the money stages model as well. That, but people think that their progression from where they are to where they're going is a straight line, but because of the compounding impact of time and money, it's actually a curve. So um, because you've got that compounding effect and it uh, ratchets up over time. So if you're not exactly on track to where you want to be, you'll notice that the shortest point between the lines, as in the, e the easiest point for you to jump, what we call jump the line, is right now. Once you do that, then you just follow the bouncing ball and it's easier, it builds momentum and then you create options for yourself. 
the longer you wait, if you leave it too long, and this is something I used to see when I first started in advice working with people that were getting closer to retirement, is that the sacrifices that you need to make to get to where you wanna be can become more and more painful and getting into you know your ideal situation um, is going to be, uh, it can be impossible in some cases. So you're making difficult decisions. So this is my motivation to say that, you know, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to get re results, the earliest time is right now, uh, and then it makes, it's never going to get easier than it is now if you want to save or invest, you know, a certain amount of money. Uh, so guys, look, I, I hope you found that helpful. I'm going to jump into Q and A in a sec. So anyone that's got any questions, feel free to chuck them into the question box. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this from Derek Sivers, which, uh, the quote says that if, if information was the answer, we'd all be billionaires with perfect abs. And it's very true that, um, we don't need more information. What we need to do is to take action and, and to get results. Um, so guys, look, obviously this is the sort of stuff that we do uh, help people with as well. So if you do want to make your um, your next step an easy one, we've I've actually put together the, we do these 45 minute money breakthrough sessions where essentially we help you get clear on the opportunities for you when it comes to your money, give you a clear list of your roadblocks that you want to clear and the ability to ask questions and get some no BS uh, answers. We charge, um, we normally charge uh, more, but I've discounted these fees just for um, the General Assembly community. I put the link actually just into the chat box for anyone that's interested. And we donate 100% of the money. It's only $195. We donate 100% of the money to our um, charity partners. We're partnered with B1G1, um, which is buy one, give one as well. This session is good for people that are, you know, if you're saving in a decent clip or if you've got a, a bunch of equity or investments um, that you can leverage to, I suppose, take action or for anyone that works in tech and I know the RSUs and ESPP um, stuff can be quite complicated. So uh, love you to get involved in that. Um, we have, we've actually raised over $25,000 uh, through doing these sessions which we started donating the money to charity uh, in COVID, we've, we've built a uh, we've built three houses for families in India, and uh, and done a bunch of other cool stuff around the world as well. So um, yeah, we'd love you to get involved there. But well, um, I'm going to jump into these questions here. I got a question here that says, "How much should I leave in my bank account when I buy a house? Should there be a buffer, or can I mostly empty it so I can buy the best property? No, to have a partner." and no kids and no real need for an emergency fund. Look, um, I think, well, if, uh, you know, I, I think that there's always a need for an emergency fund in that if you get sick or obviously we all think we're bulletproof, but you get sick, partner gets sick, family member gets sick, something happens um, with a property, you know, you need to spend some money on the property. Uh, that can be an issue as well. So I, I would say that, yeah, there's probably something there. However, you, you, in some cases, it can be okay, totally okay. And in fact, the best thing to do to spend all of the money that you've got. What makes it good or not good though, really depends on your ability to replenish that money. Um, you know, what, what sort of time frame you can replenish that money with uh, over um, in so that you you probably be more comfortable if you're saving at a really strong clip versus if you're saving really slowly because you've spent heaps on a property. Um, yeah, so there's no rule of thumb. I, I would say though that like for a target, for someone that wants to know how much they should be thinking about having an emergency fund, a good place to start if you're not sure is three months of your fixed expenses. So the expenses that wouldn't stop if you wanted them to. So you don't need to include, you know, holiday budgets and that sort of stuff, but, um, but yeah, your rent costs or mortgage costs or you know any fixed costs that you're committed to pay for. Um, so I hope you found that one helpful. Charlotte is asking, can you expand on schemes grants available to first home buyers? Are they assets based? So that's a good question, Charlotte. Yeah, there are a couple of um, there are a couple of different grants and they are state based. So check out the relevant uh, st uh, states for 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 websites for information, but. Uh, there is a, a first home buyer's grant of a, like a cash payment that you can get. There's also a stamp duty exemption. If you um, have buy properties in a certain price range, there is a cap to the property prices as well. Um, another scheme that is out there is the first home um, saver deposit scheme. And it basically allows you to buy a property with only a 5% deposit 
and the government will guarantee the rest of the money because the government's got a big balance sheet, so they're more prepared to do that. Um, but that one does have an income level cap. There are only 10,000 available each year, uh, but there's an income cap that's attached to that as well. And uh, yeah, so so check check in, in your states, but the stamp duty can be a big kicker because it's generally about 4% in New South Wales. So if you can save that, you can be a, um, a bunch of the way there already. Hope you found that one helpful, Charlotte. Uh, and I've got another one here, making additional mortgage payments versus investing disposable income. Again, Charlotte, I think it, it goes back to your strategy there, uh, really, that either can be both. You could choose to do both via like the debt recycling strategy as well. That's always an option. But it really depends on what your, I suppose, what's coming up, what's next for you, um, what's next for you in the future and, and making sure that you're finding a, a good a good balance um, and always having some money to draw on, I think is important too. I just got one more question here from Anthony, uh, which says, what are your thoughts on rent vesting, buying investment properties in say regional areas and living in renting in the locations you currently desire when purchasing is out of reach? Look, uh, yeah, I think that can be a great strategy, Anthony. Um, you or even buying properties in in areas where you want to live but maybe can't afford the the level of property that you want like i've got a client at the moment that's buying a, a property in randwick which is a smaller apartment and it's an apartment that's smaller he's got a couple of kids um and a, and a partner uh that it would be too small for them to live in together but if they um but investing into the area, it sort of starts to hedge hedge your exposure. I'm a, a, just to follow on from that. I'm not a huge fan on regional investing, um, although I know that there are some pockets where the investments have been quite strong. But you just want to make sure um, you just want to make sure that you can uh, that that you've got the population growth and areas there to to support that as well. So. I uh, hope that helps, Anthony. And Diego just uh, asked a good question, actually, which because this event uh, is the first in a five-part event series uh, that we're putting on um, with the guys with Rays and uh, and General Assembly. So we're going to we'll, we will shoot around the link so that you can check out the upcoming events there uh, off the back of the session today. So, guys, look, uh, yeah, I hope you found that helpful. Um, I will catch you at the next one. At uh, John, are you? Uh, are you going to wrap this wrap this bad boy? Yes, as always. Thank you so much. I mean, that was jet packed, full of information. Can't wait for the next one. I was just having a look at what the date we've got the next one for. If you're not on the top of your head, I think twenty second of April. So yeah, right. Three weeks away from tomorrow, and the, the, yeah, looking forward to it. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you to all of our partners as well. And to those who are still kind of on this call, I'm sure jumping in on that chat with giant thank yous. Um, we'll be sending out the recording, all that kind of good stuff. So look out for that. And then hopefully we can see you in our next event. But thank you so much, everyone. Perfect. Cheers, team. Thanks, John. See you guys. Bye.